Thank you very much for being here tonight. I'm honored to be delivering this inaugural lecture as the first ever professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Mary's University College. When people find out that I'm a professor, they often express surprise in light of my age and my lack of gray hair. I, in fact, once had a cab driver in Mainz who refused to let me in his cab because of this. The cab had been reserved for Professor Chris Keith, and he thought I was a student. <laughs> I had to tap on his window and tell him politely but firmly, Ich bin Professor Keith. <laughs> It was at 5 a.m. as well. It was really absurd. What student is up catching a cab at 5 a.m.? But <laughs> he then felt terrible and explained to me that I was a younger professor and literally drove me up onto the sidewalk outside the train station. <laughs> All I can say is that I, too, am surprised, and I can cite the happy set of circumstances that led to my appointment. Although, I should add that I failed to check the fine print of my contract from St. Mary's, which I signed in June of 2012, and apparently said at the bottom, your first year in post will be absolutely nothing like what you expect it to be when you're <laughs> signing this contract. <laughs> oh, it's cathartic, isn't it? I'm thoroughly aware, thoroughly conscious of what a special honor it is to occupy this chair how lucky I am to carry that honor. In this light, I hope you'll permit me a personal moment here before we get to the academic part of this lecture. It's only right for me to thank those who have supported me through the successes and failures alike, my wife and children. That's them, and that's not London. <laughs> my wife, Erin, is here with me tonight, as smart and beautiful as ever. If you're wondering how someone that looks like me ended up with someone that looks like her, <laughs> all I can say is get in line. If you figure that one out, you let me know, because we could bottle it and sell it to a lot of ugly, ugly guys who want to marry women out of their league. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Naylor, don't you? <laughs> We're the lucky ones. <laughs> this lecture is on memory, and Aaron, I remember when I could not decide whether I wanted to be a businessman, a lawyer, or a minister. You sat me down and insisted that I go into the academic teaching of the Bible, which has been an interesting combination of all those other professions and on many days more detached from reality than any of them. Thank you. My children aren't here tonight, and since no one's playing Angry Birds Star Wars on their iPhones, I can tell you that my five-year-old son, Jace, would be bored out of his mind. And since no one here is jumping on the bed, I can tell you that my two-year-old daughter, Hannah, would be equally bored. But that's not to say that they're not interested in the topic I'm going to address tonight. In fact, Hannah was kind enough to offer criticisms on an initial draft of the lecture. <laughs> the words themselves managed to get jumbled around due to computer magic, but you'll see that she... Uh, thought my argument was circular here in a number of areas. <laughs> she had particular problems with the shallow footnotes and told me that much of what I thought was original in my work was, in fact, derivative of an underappreciated 19th century Siberian New Testament scholar. In general, she said she had trouble identifying a coherent thesis. She's a tough critic. I hope the point of the lecture isn't quite as unclear, unclear as Hannah thought, and so I proceed to the serious stuff. In a footnote in his 1971 Myth of Christian Origins, Robert Wilkin cited French sociologist Maurice Havlock's The Social Frameworks of Memory, The Collective Memory, and The Legendary Topography of the Gospels in the Holy Land. To my knowledge, this citation is the very first interaction between scholars of the New Testament and what has become known as social memory theory. It would be another 21 years before Hobwalk's seminal social frameworks of memory, or sections of it, appeared in English. Despite several short applications and essays, it would be yet another 12 years beyond that before uh, Alan Kirk and Tom Thatcher formed the Mapping Memory Consultation of the Society of Biblical Literature in 2004. 
A year later, English-speaking New Testament scholarship received a formal introduction to the theory in Kirk and Thatcher's 2005 Semea volume, Memory, Tradition, and Text. In that volume, Kirk and Thatcher could still rightly claim it is surprising that social memory theory has, as yet, made no significant impact on biblical studies. These words are true no longer, however. In a relatively short amount of time, social memory theory has exploded onto gospel scholarship and biblical studies generally. Gospel scholars are now approaching standard issues in terms of this so-called memory approach and publishing sustained treatments, including those stemming from graduate, doctoral, and postdoctoral research. Clearly, many scholars agree with the assessment of Alan Kirk, who says, quote, The work of memory theorists on the social and cultural dimensions of memory and experimental psychologists on its cognitive operations makes it possible to rethink basic questions about the formation of the gospel tradition and the forces driving its development. End quote. Not all scholars share this sentiment, however. Foster has recently argued that memory theory is a quote-unquote dead end in historical Jesus studies and offers no significant advance beyond form criticism. He questions the understanding of New Testament scholars who use memory theory and grouping applications of orality studies, which he likewise sees as a dead end, and memory studies together, claims that neither group of New Testament scholars seems to know the field that they are importing. I quote, Those who apply the respective forms of theory described here do not appear to be cognizant of the fact that within the disciplines from which those theories are imported, the forms used as a breakthrough in New Testament studies are seen as being outmoded and largely flawed. End quote. Foster's major criticism of the memory approach concerns overconfident uh, this is a quotation, overconfident application of such approaches to the historical Jesus question, end quote, that affirm the gospel tradition as reliable. Other criticisms have likewise been voiced. I'm later in this lecture going to argue that such critiques, though accurate in some important respects, misrepresent the full breadth of applications of memory theory to the gospels and thus are not without irony. I'll argue further that this entire usage of social memory theory is illegitimate since the theory as theory neither affirms nor denies the reliability of the gospel tradition. But these and other critiques are important since they signal a certain maturation of social memory theory's presence in New Testament studies and raise the question of its contribution to the discipline. As we close the first decade of this interdisciplinary conversation then, we're in a position to assess the contributions of social memory theory to gospel scholarship as well as its limitations. I therefore offer this lecture, part one of which will present the methodological foundations of social memory theory, part two of which will then assess current applications of social memory theory in four areas of Jesus studies. Overall, I argue that although social memory theory has suffered abuse by its supporters and detractors alike, it continues to hold great promise for Jesus studies as the discipline moves steadily beyond modernist conceptions of early Christian transmission of the past. Also, to give you a bit of transparency here, uh, I first started working with social memory theory in 2003 and 2004. I wrote a master's thesis in Cincinnati, Ohio on it. And then I set it down for some time as I pursued my doctoral work and some other projects. And then I eventually came back to it. Uh, when I did, I found that the discussion had moved in a couple directions that I really thought kind of were illegitimate. It's, uh, I, I very much, uh, as it may sound absurd, but I had the sense that I'd kind of, I had a child that I had set down and then lost. And then when I found it again, I saw it in the circus doing something that I'd never planned for it. So we all know how that is, right? Uh, so, so to a certain extent, this is an attempt to uh, set things right, to get the discussion back on the tracks uh, of the methodology instead of uh, the distracting discussions that have been happening. The roots of social memory theory reach into numerous philosophical, linguistic, anthropological, and sociological fields of research. The significant contributors to critical discourse on memory thus comprise an impressive list of scholars from various time periods and disciplines. Freud, Marx, Levi-Strauss, Nietzsche, Foucault, Derrida, Gadamer, Nora, Ricoeur, many others. Most important for understanding the current state of gospel scholarship in light of social memory theory are Maurice Havlocks, Jan Osman, and Barry Schwartz. Havlocks was the founder of social memory theory, while Osman 
and Schwartz are the leading voices in Germany and the United States, respectively. Maurice Hovwachs, which apparently lost a mustache competition with Friedrich Nietzsche, <laughs> under the influences of philosopher Henri Bergson and sociologist Emile Durkheim, he was the first scholar to develop a sociological approach to memory in, the, in his 1925 The Social Frameworks of Memory. He argues consistently against the psychological view of memory as a store and retrieval, store and retrieval function that primarily concerns the preservation of the past in an individual's mind. He insists instead that memories are always recalled from and thus structured by the social demands of the present. In other words, memory is not like a filing cabinet where you put past events and then you can go collect them when you want and they're pristine in the exact way they happen. For Hovwalks, memory is not primarily a past-oriented function of the individual. It is a present-oriented function of the individual in society. Accordingly, he says, quote, There is no point in seeking where memories are preserved in my brain or in some nook of my mind to which I alone have access, for they are recalled to me externally, and the groups of which I am a part at any time give me the means to reconstruct them. Let me put this in less technical terms. Have you ever had a bad breakup? Sorry, have you? Yeah? Good. Does anyone want to tell a story? No? Okay. If you've ever had a bad breakup, but you thought it was going to make it before it collapsed, right? Then you have that friend, or maybe you are that friend, who comes to you and says, Why are you with this person? Do you not notice what just happened? Do you not notice how they neglect you, how they did this, that, and the other? And while you still have the hope that it's going to work out, what happens? Oh, no. You don't know him or her. You don't see how they talk to me in private. You don't, they were just having a bad day. You defend them. You assert how great they are, right? And then pff, it all blows up, right? And then you go back to that friend, and all of a sudden you say, why didn't you tell me how awful this person was for me? I would have never tried to make it last. You know, what about when they did this awful thing to me? Or if you are that friend, you think, yeah, I did tell you that. You ignore me. What actually happened never changed. Your present circumstances changed, and that changed the way you viewed what happened. And Hovwalt was trying to capture the way present social reality changes how you view the past, whether that past really happened or whether it's created. Although sometimes less than clear, Havox does not ignore the role of the individual in emphasizing the influence of the group. His point is simply that individuals borrow from society everything that enables conceptualization of the past. Thus, the present environment dictates the reconstruction of the past, even for the individual. He says, quote, It is in this sense that there exists a collective memory and social frameworks for memory. It is to the degree that our individual thought places itself in these frameworks and par participates in this memory that, is capable, that it is capable of the act of recollection. As this last quotation indicates, Hovwalks uses the terms social memory and collective memory in overlapping but distinct ways. When he speaks of social memory or the social frameworks of memory, he refers to the impact of present society on the individual. Collective memory instead refers to a shared cultural past to which individuals contribute and upon which they call, but ultimately a past that transcends individual memory. Since collective memory is crucial for informing group identity, it is a past that the group actively manages. In other words, it's an intentional formation of the past. Havlock's theory is not a flawless system, but... His insights concerning the impact of the present on the formation and articulation of memory have proven not only accurate, but immensely fertile. They've spawned a discourse of social or collective memory that crosses a plethora of disciplines, topics, and ideological perspectives. And at least three aspects of this work are particularly significant for gospel studies. First is the actual past. To, re to reiterate a point that I just made, collective memory, according to Havlox, is unconcerned with issues relating to the actual past. It is precisely this notion of memory as a preservation function against which Havlox rails. This point bears repeating because in colloquial language we often juxtapose memory of the past with invention of the past, thereby imbuing memory with a meaning that's akin to historical accuracy. Importing this common understanding of memory to social memory discourse would be a category mistake. 
Collective memory refers to the representation of the past in light of the needs of the present with no automatic assumption at the outset about the degree to which that representation may reflect past reality. Second, despite Hobwalk's interest in the actual past and its influence upon collective memory has not remained outside the boundaries of social memory research. Several factors are responsible for this, one of which is the second important point. Hobwalk's concentration upon the role of the present in memory at the expense of the past led eventually to two schools of social or collective memory theory. One school follows Hobwalk's and his emphasis upon the present and thus is thus termed presentism, social constructionism, or constructivism. Presentists are primarily concerned with the ways in which present interests exploit the past and exercise their will over it. Conspiracy theorists love this perspective. In contrast, scholars who affirm the continuity perspective or the essentialist position associated with Barry Schwartz, to whom we'll get in a minute, place equal emphasis upon the past, asserting that Havelock's near single-minded focus upon the present neglected the ways in which the past and past interpretations of the past can constitute or contribute to the social frameworks of the present. That is, although not denying Havelock's insi insights concerning the socially constructed nature of memory, they argue that the relationship between the past and the present in memory is not a one-way street, but rather a more complex phenomenon of mutual influence. Third, Havelock himself saw early Christianity as a prime example of collective memory. He has an entire chapter in Social Frameworks of Memory on religious collective memory. His second major work was on the topography of the Gospels in the Holy Lands. He, he, it was a, it's a fascinating study on how very, in various historical periods when crusaders came to the Holy Land, they found holy sites anew and that the sites you know, were moving. But various periods of crusaders had moved the topography of the Holy Lands. And furthermore, Havelox makes ample usage of Ernst Renan's Life of Jesus and even claims, quote, the Gospels already represent a memory or collection of memories held in common by a group. Havelock's work on collective memory had a major influence on Egyptologist Jan Osman's development of a theory of cultural memory. In a number of publications over more than 25 years, Osman addressed a weakness he perceived in Havelock's, namely that Havelock's never applied his insights into group memory at the cultural level in a sustained way. Along with his wife, literary theorist Elida Osman, Osman's impact in German-speaking memory scholarship has been substantial. Only recently have English translations of their most important works appeared. Osman's cultural memory theory operates within the ambit of Havelock's collective memory, but extends far beyond it. For the living group's collective memory, Osman coins the term communicative memory. In contrast, cultural memory, culturelle gedachtnis, refers to memorial practices that go beyond living memory and cross generations. He says, quote, with cultural memory, the depths of time open up, end quote. In this sense, cultural memory is communicative memory stretched vertically across generations instead of horizontally across individuals. And what communication is for communicative memory, tradition is for cultural memory. The cultural texts, that constitute the tradition, whether oral or written, serve as, quote, the cement or connective backbone of a society that ensures its identity and coherence through the sequence of generations. So for Havelock's collective memory is how you and all of your friends think about the car wreck that you were just in. For Osman, cultural memory refers to how I, as a Kentucky, Kentuckian, identify with other Kentuckians from 100, 200 years ago. Very simplistic, but that's kind of what it is. Like Havelock's collective memory, cultural memory is not concerned with the actual past and the discipline of history in the sense of verification of historical claims. Osman instead describes his investigation of cultural memory as uh, Nemo history and claims, unlike history proper, Nemo history is concerned not with the past as such, but only the past as it is remembered. It surveys the storylines of tradition, the webs of intertextuality, the diachronic continuities and discontinuities of reading the past, end quote. Memories, memo history's aim is, quote, not to ascertain the possible truth of traditions, but to study these traditions as phenomena of collective memory, end quote. 
In addition to important similarities, Osman's cultural memory theory is also dissimilar from Havelock's in several manners relating to the past and the actual past. Osman refers, uh, reserves a firm role for the influence of the past upon the construction of collective memory in the present. He says, quote, the past is not simply received by the present. The present is haunted by the past, and the past is modeled, invented, re and the, reinvented, and reconstructed by the present, End quote. Osman thus reveals a more complex interchange. Worth noting is that this does not mean that the influence of the past necessarily derives from the actual past, since memories may be false, distorted, invented, or implanted. At the same time, the actual past is not entirely irrelevant for Osman's cultural memory theory, not because Osman asserts a direct connection between history and memory, but rather because he reconceptualizes them as related. He says, quote, Memo history is not the opposite of history, but rather is one of its branches or subdisciplines. Memo history is reception theory applied to history, end quote. Osman here reveals an important shift in memory discourse since the Havelock's in the 1920s. Since this very shift is the fault line at which debates over the usefulness of memory in historical Jesus research are occurring, it requires further comment. To state the previous point in perhaps a more succinct way, Osman does not so much redefine the relationship between memory and history as much as he redefines the goals and expectations of his history in light of memory. Havelock still worked with a positivist understanding of history as recovery of raw elements of the past, much as the form critics in Germany understood it at precisely the same historical period. As Osman notes, quote, the task of historical positivism consists in separating the historical from the mythical elements in memory and distinguishing the elements which retain the past from those which shape the present, end quote. Havelock was interested only in the latter element of this equation, the present, and thus viewed history proper, that is, recovery of the retained past, as the opposite of collective memory, which was thoroughly entwined with current social realities. And, and so, for Havelock, history stands outside reality, Osman notes. It's a functionless artifact, isolated from the bonds and obligations imposed by life. End quote. In an intriguing aspect... Of social memory theories, Forschungsgeschichte, then, Havelock ironically maintained a positivist understanding of history while simultaneously introducing a theory of the past in the form of collective memory that would contribute to the collapse of that very understanding. Osman's criticism of Havelock in this regard concerns precisely the antithetical relationship between history and memory that Havelock maintains. Moving on. With Osman's cultural memory theory, then, one takes a decisive step also into media criticism of the ancient world. In view of the relationship between the oral and the written, uh, Osman places this, uh, this issue at the very base of cultural memory theory. He views the technology of writing as the decisive enabling catalyst for transgenerational cultural memory because writing enables an extended situation beyond a transmission context of co-presence. In other words, since Osman is very much interested in how generations pass, hand down the past, he saw writing as the, writing as the primary means to do that. Uh, ritual um, and oral tradition require co-presence. They require everybody to be in the same room or the same uh, bonfire, whatever, wherever they're doing their transmission. But writing allows people to be distanced. Oral cultures have cultural memory then, but these contexts of transmission, insofar as they demand simultaneous presence, they pale in comparison to written texts, which are not restricted. They can cross land, sea, and decades, so long as the papyrus survives and there's someone who can read the language on the other end. Thus, only, in, according to Osman, only with the emergence of writing does cultural memory take off and allow the horizon of symbolically stored memory to go far beyond the framework of knowledge functionalized as bonding memory. Third, like Havelock, Osman developed his, so, his theory of memory in light of and upon biblical text. He viewed ancient Israel as an example par excellence of the workings of cultural memory and begins his uh, cultural memory in early civilization with a discussion of the Pentateuch. 
His writings are replete with discussions of Old Testament Hebrew Bible texts and traditions. Osman also interacts with the work of New Testament scholar Gerd Tyson and, like Hovwalks, treats the Jesus tradition as cultural memory. Over roughly the same period of time that Osman was shepherding the legacy of Hovwalks in Germany, sociologist Barry Schwartz has been performing the same task in the United States. As the leading voice of the continuity perspective on collective memory, Schwartz has advocated in a number of publications that, although the past is malleable, its malleability knows limits. Although he often sounds like Hovwalks, Schwartz argues consistently that Hovwalks' and presentist emphasis on the all-powerful present presents a, quote, one-sided perspective. For Schwartz, quote, to conceive of memory as a mirror of reality is to conceive of fiction. For if, independently of historical evidence, our changing understanding of the past uniquely parallels changes in our society, then the only relevant reality would be the present, and the very concept of collective memory would be meaningless. To conceive the meaning of the past as fixed and steady is likewise meaningless, since any event must appear differently as perceptual circumstances change." Quote. Importantly, then, Schwartz's position is not the opposite of the presentist position. That would be historical positivism. It's a modification of it that accounts for the fact that, in Michael Shudson's words, quote, "...the past is, in some respects and under some conditions, highly resistant to efforts to make it over." End quote. Schwartz thus consistently steers a middle course in insisting on continuity between the past and the present. He says, quote, "...in most cases we find the past to be neither totally precarious nor immutable, but a stable image upon which new elements are intermittently superimposed." End quote. Just to give you a, a, an extreme example uh, that appears in the literature quite often is death. Uh, you, if you are remembering the death of a loved one, there's only so much you can hermeneutically do with that memory because there is the reality in the present that that loved one is no longer there. So there, there are limits to which you can remake the past in the image of the present. Uh, that's an extreme example, but there are a lot of others. The one I often use is 9-11, which, of course, in the U.S. and abroad is still heavily debated. You can have a lot of versions of the past about what happened there, but it is constrained by the fact that the Twin Towers are no longer there. Whatever your version of that story is, it has to, it has to reflect the fact that they're not there anymore. Uh, so, so the past knows limits, and that's what these scholars are observing. Schwartz's relevance for New Testament studies is great, as is indicated by the fact that a Semea volume dedicated to his work is forthcoming from New Testament scholars. Furthermore, he has worked to become intimately familiar with New Testament studies. He presented papers at the annual meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature in 2003 and 2010, as well as the 2012 Jesus Conference in Dayton, Ohio. Schwartz has also published several contributions to New Testament scholarship as a sociologist. I want to highlight two aspects of his work very briefly. First, and most important, consistent with the continuity perspective and contrary to the perspective of Hovwalks, Schwartz reserves a role for the past in his theory of collective memory, as I've already stated. But we have to be careful here. As was the case with Osman also, the idea that the past pressures the present does not lead directly to the further idea that this pressure comes from what really happened. According to Schwartz, quote, stable images of the past are not always demonstrably true images. Sometimes false ideas are transferred across generations and accepted as if they were true. End quote. The impact of the past in the first instance simply refers to the inertia of past interpretation upon present conception. On the other hand, for Schwartz, the actual past remains one possible source for the inertia of the past, among others. He says, quote, sometimes individuals experience something they cannot forget, end quote. That is, sometimes what really happened leads to or at least restrains present conception of the past. Second, Schwartz thus joins the ranks of Hovwalks and Osman as foundational social memory theorists who have applied social memory theory to the New Testament related fields. He explicitly addresses the Gospels in this regard. Quote, the job of social memory scholarship is to assess what we know, assembling documents like the Gospels, estimating their meanings and relations to the culture of which their authors were a part, and drawing conclusions. From the social memory standpoint, then, our object of study is not the authenticity of the Gospels. 
It is rather the Gospels as sources of information about the popular beliefs of early Christianity. End quote. Therefore, although Schwartz is careful to preserve a role for the past, his general assessment is that the goal of social memory inquiry affirms what Osman also said. In the first instance, it is not about discovering the actual past, but understanding why the tradition developed in the manners that it did. Before moving on, a few summarizing points are necessary. First, that social memory discourse is relevant for and applicable to New Testament studies is beyond question. In addition to the fact that the aforementioned major figures discussed the traditions of ancient Israel or early Christianity, one could also cite studies of Jewish history from a social memory perspective outside biblical studies. The Bible and its worlds form a cornerstone of the discourse regardless of whether biblical specialists contribute to it. We might as well contribute to it. Second is the issue of jargon. It should be clear, social memory, collective memory, and cultural memory do not technically refer to the same phenomena. Add to these terms further nuanced jargon such as autobiographical memory, individual memory, historical memory, communicative memory, and a host of others not named here but appearing in the literature, not named here in the lecture itself but named here on the slide, hot memory, cold memory, normative memory, formative memory, counter memory, connective memory, cognitive memory, inscribed memory, embodied memory, contrapresent memory, and one has a recipe for serious confusion. And some of you who aren't interested in this discussion might be thinking, why in the world would anyone spend so much time delineating between these things? All I can say is, we're just trying to have a career here. Third, although the relationship between the actual past and commemoration of the past, that is, under, under the modernist conceptions, history and memory, is important to each of these scholars, it's important in varying ways. The actual past is important to Havlox as the antithesis of collective memory. Osman sees cultural memory and memo history as related to, but distinct from, interest in, in historical truth. Schwartz displays the most affinity for seeing historical interests as adjacent to collective memory. If we use then Pierre Nora, uh, who, who is widely considered the true heir of Havlox, as the mouthpiece for Havlox, the following quotations reveal differing understandings of the relationship between history and memory in these scholars' works. Memory and history, far from being synonymous, are thus in many respects opposed. Memo history is not the opposite of history, but rather is one of its branches. Collective memory is based on two sources of belief about the past, history and commemoration. I'll give you a, a teaser here for where I'm going. Anyone who says collective memory theory is X and doesn't define what they mean by that in terms of the methodology is, is doing, doing his or her readers a disservice because... It's not any one thing in particular. There's a great variety of opinion. In light of these differences, though, what these scholars hold in common is worth underscoring. All are agreed that social approaches to memory are primarily interested in the development of the tradition, not historical accuracy. When and where social memory theory is interested in historical accuracy, that is, the continuity perspective, it's interested insofar as the past could have contributed to the development of social frameworks that enable formation of memory in the present. Equally important, then, is that although social memory theory is not primarily interested in inquiries into historical truth, it is not irrelevant for such inquiries either. One might say instead that social memory theory is the first port of call. Historians must reckon first with the com complex relationship between the past and the present in any commemorative activity. Asking further questions about the possibility of the actual past contribution is a separate and subsequent stage of investigating those complexities. In this sense, social memory theory is not so much a historiographical method as it is a theory of social construction of the past that enables responsible historiography. Now, from the method to modern applications of it in gospel studies. The impact of social memory theory on gospel's research has masked a stunningly diverse appropriation of the method in New Testament scholarship and its related fields more broadly. Scholars have applied social memory theory to topics such as Paul and Pauline literature, the epistle to the Hebrews, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Didache, the Apostolic Fathers, Melito of Sardis, the Tomb of James, the Brother of Jesus, Trajan's Column, later Christian pagan conflict, and even Egyptian magical papyri. Nevertheless, it's undeniable that social memory theory's most demonstrable inroads into New Testament scholarship reside in Jesus' studies. I will here address four specific issues in gospel studies that relate to the relationship between the past and the present and the formation of the gospels. Number one, the transmission of the oral Jesus tradition. Number two, criteria of authenticity. Number three, the new historiography. And number four, the historical reliability of the Jesus tradition. So the transmission of the oral gospel tradition informed criticism. Although not receiving the kind of attention that social memory theory has received in historical Jesus studies, the most matured area of application of social memory theory in gospels research concerns the transmission of the oral Jesus tradition. Led by Huron, Horsley, Kelber, Kirk, and Thatcher, many scholars have found social memory theory's descriptions of the dynamic relationship between the present and the past a useful framework for conceptualizing the transmission of the oral Jesus tradition. Rodriguez has written a full monograph on the topic, and Eve has also employed the memory approach in his overview of the scholarly discussion. Since the formation and transmission of the oral Jesus tradition was the focus of form criticism, it is little surprise that many applications of social memory theory in this area have engaged form criticism and its lingering effects in gospel scholarship. Many assessments of form criticism in this regard have been critical. In light of its near total emphasis upon the, uh, in light of its near total emphasis upon the Sitzenleben der Kirche, whether we take by that the Hellenistic or Palestinian church, over the Sitzenleben Jesu, gospel scholars as well as social memory theorists outside biblical studies have identified form criticism as a thoroughly presentist perspective. Although it is merely repeating the earlier opinion of Bultmann. Winter's assessment of the controversy narrative serves as a clear example of this presentist tendency. He says, quote, All the Markan controversies without exception reflect disputes between the apostolic church and its social environment and are devoid of roots in the circumstances of the life in Jesus. End quote. Just in case uh, you've, uh, I, I managed with my sweet southern drawl to lull you to sleep. The point of that statement there. All the Mark and Controversy narratives. In other words, what Winter is saying is that every time you look in the Gospels, which I know we all do, every time you look in the Gospels and you see Jesus arguing with one of the scribal leaders of his day, that is all a product of later Christianity, which was at the time arguing with Jewish leadership in, in the late first century. And Winter's statement is, it is devoid of roots in the circumstances in the life of Jesus. As I mentioned just a minute ago, this is a thoroughly presentist perspective. The present reality of the gospel authors is read entirely into their version of the past. There's no remainder of the past there. They're just making this up. From the continuity perspective of social memory theory, the failure to consider seriously the ways in which the past could have contributed to early Christians' presence is a severe oversight. For the early Christian communities were not theologizing castles in the sky detached from all socio-historical circumstances. In other words, that fails to answer a very legitimate question of, well, why were those controversies going on in the late first century? Previous typologies provide categories for the present and thus structure or restrain the interpretive freedom of the present to an extent as groups assimilate the novum to the known. In some instances, such as the scripted violence of a crucifixion, the past presses itself more forcibly upon the present, even while the present scrambles to find typological frames with which to master the shattering of group identity. The past does not always pressure the present in this manner, but examples such as this point to a much more complex interaction between the present and the past. Another area in which scholars have been critical of form criticism is its treatment of the shift between oral and written tradition. Although this shift, and, and for those, uh, for those uh, of us who work more broadly in the humanities, you'll know that the shift between or orality and textuality is a very, very core issue. Uh, Plato was very concerned about this. It stands at, at the very base of Derrida's of grammatology. Uh, this, is, this is an important issue, uh, and memory theorists, too, deal with this issue, including gospel scholars who are in memory theory. Although the shift served as a crucial threshold between early Palestinian Christianity and later Hellenistic Christianity, 
Bultmann famously regarded the transition between orality and textuality as, quote, nothing in principle new, but only completing what was begun in the oral tradition. In other words, he saw it as a logical conclusion of orality. In 1983, Kelber persuasively argued on the basis of the dynamics of oral tradition that the textualization of Mark's gospel, and for those of you who aren't gospel uh, scholars, most scholars take Mark's gospel as the first written gospel, and so it is the first narrativized instance of the textualization of Jesus' tradition. Kelber argued that it was not logical, evolutionary, or, orga or an organic as Bultmann had imagined. Rather, and as Graham Stanton had earlier observed, it is a significant alteration to the Jesus tradition that requires explanation, especially in light of the fact that the vast majority of the ancient world was illiterate and didn't need it in a text and probably couldn't read the text anyway. Why, why then put it in a text? Osman's concept of cultural memory adds considerable weight to Kelber's and Stanton's observations that it's important and it needs an explanation. The textualization of tradition is a reconstitution of the identity-marking efforts of the tradition that occurs at the crosshairs of communicative and cultural memory. It's thus an important step also on the path toward canonization. So Kelber, Alan Kirk, Joanna Dewey, and myself, we have all drawn upon Osman in this regard. Applications of memory theory to early Christian media transitions have not focused singly on the Gospel of Mark, though. In his and Alan Kirk's seminal 2005 Semea volume, Tom Thatcher addressed the Gospel of John's transition from oral to written tradition. Thatcher observes that the Jehannine author's concept of spirit-enabled memory of Jesus that leads into all truth. For those of you who are familiar with the Gospel of John, you'll remember this passage about the paraclete or the advocate is going to help come and, and lead you into all truth. Well, based on that idea, why in the world do we need a text as an archive, which is how John, Jehannine scholars typically viewed the textualization of John? Thatcher therefore suggests that John's Gospel was textualized in order to draw upon the rhetorical value of text as material artifacts in order to seal a particular Christology. A move, he says, that would at once preserve his unique vision of Jesus, freeze that vision in a perpetually non-negotiable medium, and assert the special authority of that vision against competing perspectives. End quote. Finally, form criticism's division of the gospel tradition and traditions that reflect the past, the Zitzim Leben Jesu, or the present, the Zitzim Leben der Kirche, stand in direct opposition to Hobwalk's and others' insights concerning memory formation. If all memory is constructed from the perspective of the present, there is no tradition or memory that can be extricated from those present social frameworks. I'll return to this in just a moment. In light of these critical assessments of form criticism, one could easily get the impression that scholars employing the memory approach have only been critical of form criticism, but this would be incorrect. They have also noted uh, important similarities. For example, Samuel Bierskog has incorporated form criticism focus on particular forms into a memory-based approach, viewing Kriya as mnemonic devices in narratives. Ruben Zimmermann, too, has stressed the necessary role of particular forms in traditioning processes from a memory perspective. In several publications, he focuses upon parables and argues, quote, that short forms acted as the media of a primarily oral memory culture. These appropriations, therefore, generally stand in the line of Osman's cultural memory theory. Furthermore, they demonstrate that, contrary to the claims of some critics, New Testament scholars who have appropriated social memory theory have been neither oblivious to its similarities to form criticism nor solely ne negative of form criticism. The relationship between social memory theory and form criticism also stands at the crux of another important issue in recent gospel studies, the criteria of authenticity. The criteria of authenticity are no strangers to criticism, and I don't think I'm going to repeat all of this in depth. The criteria uh, work as sieves or filters for the Jesus tradition, almost like a, a, um, a gold miner panning for gold. You sift through the tradition and find the piece that's authentic and reflects the past. All right, well, if social memory theory is correct uh, on this point, and I think that it is, then the disciplinary power from which these, thing, these criteria have operated for almost 100 years, or, or at least the, the, logic, the, the logic that underpins these criteria goes back uh, at least to 1521. 
uh, the, these, uh, these are very problematic uh, because there is no raw nuggets of the past that exist to be sifted if everything reflects the perspective of the present to one degree or another. Thus, as Rafael Rodriguez mentions, memory does not preserve the past in a way that allows for the separation of historical fact and later interpretation. In the South, we would say, Amen. Or, as Jesus might say, uh, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> Importantly, in light of the new historiography in Jesus' studies discussed immediately below, one should note here that Rodriguez does not claim that historians are incapable of making informed decisions about historical fact and later interpretation. He only asserts that the tradition itself cannot be divided in this way. Along these lines, several New Testament scholars, a chorus of New Testament scholars, have joined in abandoning this traditional method. The new historiography. The rather simple observation about the inseparable nature of past reality and present interpretation has toppled over 100 years of method in historical Jesus studies, the criteria of authenticity, because it requires a redefinition of history and memory that does not hold these two concepts in opposition by defining the former as the past that historians must recover from interpretations in the sources and the latter as an interpretation in the source that has to be recovered. Earlier, we saw a similar development in the memory theories of Havlox and Osman. In most cases, at stake is not whether there is a conceptual, heuristic distinction between the actual past and interpretations of it, but rather the role of interpretive categories uh, in approaching that past, and two, what approaching the past actually entails. Applications of these theories to, gospel, to the Gospels collectively represent a new historiography in historical Jesus studies that breaks sharply from the atomistic criteria approach and similar approaches that focus upon isolated sayings or act, actions of Jesus. Jens Schroeder has consistently led these efforts to construct uh, Neu Testamentliche Wissenschaft Insights des uh, Historismus. It is notable that recent criticisms of social memory applications in gospel studies fail to engage his work altogether. In very general terms, Schroeder pr proposes that every approach to the historical Jesus behind the gospels <clears throat> has to explain how these writings could have come into being as the earliest descriptions of this person. Insofar as this approach grounds historical Jesus inquiry into, in the past as portrayed in our extant sources, it is similar to what Osman labeled memo history, which also foregrounds the texts and traditions as they stand before historians. Related directly to this fact, Schroeder insists that one cannot neatly separate the past and present, history and interpretation, due to their intertwined and mutually dependent natures and commemorative activity. Moving to the actual past. The role of the actual past in the new historiography is a less than straightforward issue. Some scholars remain interested in positing a historical reality behind the Gospels. Like social memory theory outside Gospel scholarship, however, applications of the method inside Gospel scholarship differ on this naughty epistemological issue. Ladon, for example, is more interested in halting historical inquiries at the earliest recoverable mnemonic sphere and finds discussion of a past reality that is separate from its commemorations unhelpful. Schroeder, Allison, and I, to the contrary, agree that scholars can at least offer hypotheses about how things could have been. In other words, we can take informed guesses. This affirmation, with, which basically reflects the continuity perspective of Schwartz and others, requires clear articulation because it's open to misunderstanding. By affirming that scholars can theorize a historical Jesus behind the Gospels, this approach does not assume that scholars can access an uninterpreted past reality behind the Gospels, much less that they can do so by dispensing with the interpretive categories in the Gospels. These are the assumptions of form criticism, the criteria approach, and the historical positivism to which they gave expression. In stark contrast, the new historiography affirms that there is no access to the past apart from the interpretive categories of the sources. 
It is only through the transmutation of formative events into transmissible tradition artifacts that the past is preserved at all, Alan Kirk says. Thus, in response to Wedderburn, Schroeder states, quote, Of course, I do not deny that there was a reality to which texts like, for example, the Gospels refer. But this, of course, does not mean that I would presuppose that this reality is accessible independently of the sources. The decisive point is that we have access to the past only by critical interpretation of the sources and never independently of them. What you are seeing here is the postmodern shift in historiography taking place in Jesus' studies. So similarly, Ruben Zimmermann, which provides an eloquent quote, which I would like to take as kind of the catchphrase for this entire new shift. Eskept keine Historie jenseits des Textes, aber eskept Historie durch, durch den Text und als Text, through the text. And as text. In other words, you're not trying to get on the other side of it. You're just trying to explain how it came to be, and however that may be. The impact of the past. The new historiography in Jesus' studies thus reserves a possible role for the actual past in the production of social memory as part, and only one part of a larger concern to take seriously the impact of the inertia of the commemorated past upon the formation of memory in the present. As noted earlier, this approach marks a clear difference with form criticism and is unfortunate that Foster overlooks this point in his claim that social memory theory's capacity to provide insights amounts to what form criticism has already contributed. He says, quote, reflecting upon what the Jesus tradition's pastoral or pedagogical function might have been in early believing communities, end quote. Certainly, this approach shares with form criticism a concern to understand and explain the Jesus tradition in light of its present community functions. It would never want to separate it from that. Unlike form criticism, however, the new historiography insists that any given present community, as well as the Jesus tradition it transmits, is itself constituted by the received past. Thus, scholarly inquiry does not stop at observing coinciding elements of the Jesus tradition and community identity, but also asks programmatically about how the inherited past places pressure upon and even forms those present frameworks in various ways. I think I've covered for the most part the issue of interpretive categories, so I'd like to move on in my time. The historiographical shift toward offering explanations of, for the sources in historical Jesus studies then should not be interpreted as an automatic affirmation of those sources' historical trustworthiness, whether by supporters or detractors of social memory theory. There's an excellent example that Barry Schwartz gives. He observes that John F. Kennedy was born in Boston, and this symbolically connects him uh, to the Boston Tea Party. And he goes on to say, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't born in Boston, just because it has a symbolic function. Uh, and, and this is kind of the same move that people are trying to make in Jesus studies by saying, just because it serves a current community function doesn't mean that it's worthless when we talk about the past. This brings us to social memory theory and the historical reliability of the Gospels. You may have observed already that this entire lecture is to say that this discussion is the one that we shouldn't be having. So appropriately, I'm going to end by having it. As the previous discussion has already revealed, undoubtedly the greatest source of contention between critics and supporters of social memory theory and gospel scholarship has been the employment of theory in arguments for the historical reliability of the gospels. Bockham, Bockmule, Keener, McIver, and others have appealed to memory studies in arguments for the general historical reliability of the Jesus tradition, or at least the fact that it stems from eyewitness testimony. Foster, Crook, and others have countered that memory studies either fail to favor the historical reliability of the Gospels or, in fact, favor the historical unreliability of the Gospels. They have thus characterized appropriations of social memory theory and gospel scholarship in general as, quote, assertions that social memory theory validates the historicity of the events it purports to communicate, end quote. The foregoing discussion should suffice for demonstrating that such portraits of social memory theory's presence in gospel scholarship are so narrow as to be caricatures. The majority of scholars applying the theory do not use it to those ends. And I suggest here that this to and fro over the reliability of memory has obscured social memory theory's genuine contributions to gospel scholarship, 
which re reside in its challenges to prior and particularly form critical tradition models. First, and perhaps most importantly, social memory theory as a theory does not establish the Gospels as historically reliable or unreliable. It is not the business of theory to do the work of the theorist. There seems to be a logic to which both sides of this debate adhere. It runs like this. If the Jesus tradition is memory, and if memory is inherently reliable or unreliable, then the Jesus tradition is inherently reliable or unreliable. The logic is flawed, however, because, quote, memory is a process, not a thing, and it works differently at different points in, in time, end quote. Stated otherwise, memory can be both reliable and re unreliable. Social memory theory is a tool for understanding the process by which groups conceptualize their individual and communal past from the position of the present. And importantly, Historically accurate and historically inaccurate social memories were subject to the same mnemonic processes. Social memory theory is not, therefore, in itself a tool that establishes or pronounces memory as historically accurate or inaccurate. As we saw earlier, this doesn't mean that social memory theory is irrelevant for questions of historical accuracy, but it does serve to underscore that the analytical categories of memory and social memory do not function like a wall socket into which one plugs the Jesus tradition automatically granting it currency as generally reliable or generally unreliable. Theorizing historical accuracy is more difficult than stating generalizations of memory. This point's also why is it, it is important to note that the continuity perspective of memory asserts primarily that there's continuity between earlier and later instances of memory, not necessarily that there's continuity between the actual past and later instances of memory. In terms of historical Jesus research, this is why Schroeder has insisted that Jesus historians must account for the interpretations of Jesus that exist in our sources, but insisted equally strongly that neither those sources nor any particular theory dictate how a historian must account for them. The historian's responsibility is to explain how any given instance of reception of the Jesus tradition in the extant sources reflects the pressures of the present and the past even if that instance of reception is an attempt to subvert the ideologies of either source of pressure. In some cases, the attempt to explain the extant sources leads to a conclusion about the historical Jesus and the reliability or unreliability of particular traditions. As an example, my Jesus' Literacy, which is over there on sale, and I encourage you to get it. It serves as a fine cup holder. I make a conclusion about whether Jesus really could read or write. But I do this because of trying to account for the interpretations, not trying to discount any of them. Since social memory theory seeks primarily to understand continuity and discontinuity in the formation of collective memory, it's most advantageous to historical Jesus scholars in instances of multiple, particularly conflicting interpretations of Jesus. From these, one can, in Ladon's words, triangulate a possible past reality that could have led to them is then the Jesus scholar's responsibility to forward convincing arguments about precisely how a proposed past led to those early Christian interpretations. I should, I should, I should stop, period, but I should stop here just to comment. Um, historically, these issues where the Gospels have contradictions or disagreements over Jesus, one says he died on, you know, the synoptic Gospels say that Jesus died uh, on the day of Passover, and the Gospel of John says Jesus died on the day of preparation, and none of them say that he died twice, and that would be a big theological problem if he did. Uh, but historically, in Jesus' studies, these have kind of been a problem. Well, which one's right, which one, you know. Uh, certainly, the uh, theological context in which I was reared, this was a big problem, right? And, but from this perspective, this is great for the historian. It's these instances where we primarily have an opportunity to actually theorize something uh, because we have multiple interpretations and we can ask what led to both, both or all of those interpretations. One side effect of this method, therefore, is that even historically inaccurate Jesus traditions are regarded as holding historical value for scholars. This point requires nuance, however. It would be exceedingly easy to confuse affirming that various receptions of Jesus are of value to the scholar with affirming their historical accuracy. 
The preceding discussion is thus clarified that approaching the Jesus tradition as historically situated social memory does not predetermine how that tradition is historically situated and thus its historical accuracy. Therefore, and finally, although social memory theory does make a definitive contribution to the new historiography and historical Jesus studies, fanfare and fears of its implications for historical reliability are equally misplaced. Pronouncements on the historical reliability of the Gospels remain as anchored in scholarly argumentation and proposals for plausible historical scenarios as they always have been. What is new in the new historiography is not the conclusions that scholars reach, but rather how scholars use the extant historical evidence in reaching their conclusions. The new historiographers no longer see the Jesus tradition as we have it in the Gospels, as the raw materials with which we start, and then must purify down to historically useful data by means of separation from early Christian interpretive activity. The tradition is now viewed as a finished commemorative product that needs not be dissected so much as accounted for. Historical Jesus research has changed at its roots as this new understanding of the Jesus tradition has broken away from atomistic, form critically inspired approaches to the Gospels and historical Jesus such as the criteria of authenticity. Social memory theory's contribution to discussions of the historical reliability of the Jesus tradition thus occurs at the methodological level, not the level of determination. It clarifies that those arguments that actually account for the historical evidence, however they may account for them, are better than arguments that explain only part of the evidence. To repeat the main point of the, of the conclusion of the earlier section, social memory theory is not a replacement for scholarly historiography. It is a tool that enables scholars to perform that task responsibly in light of the extant evidence. These are not the only areas of application of social memory theory to Jesus studies. I've chosen these areas because they collectively highlight a particular contribution that social memory theory makes to Jesus studies. Articulation of how modern scholars should approach the past of Jesus and his earliest interpreters, and how the past of Jesus approached his earliest interpreters and modern scholars. These core issues always have been and always will be at the center of gospel studies. And from this perspective... Social memory theory's contribution to New Testament studies does not reside in its innovation. Rather, as its first decade in gospel studies reveal, reveals, social memory theory's contribution to gospel studies resides in its capacity to move standard lines of inquiry away from a historical positivist methodological framework. Far from being a dead end, it is a pathway to the future insisting that the complexities of the past-present interaction and commemorative activities of early Christians must find expression in a field of scholarship that has previously demonstrated a tendency to simplify them in an unwarranted fashion. Thank you.